Dr. James Beckett here with Chris Harris, Stale Gum. We're going to do dueling questions. Really looking forward to this. Thanks, sponsors. Heritage Auctions, Hugs and Scott Auctions, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Burbank Sports Cards, Tops, Upper Deck, Panini, Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication, and ComC.com. So, Chris, hit me with your first question, and welcome to the show. All right. Thanks, Dr. Beckett, for having me on. You're a statistician by trade, and I'm an economist, and there's a little bit of an overlap between our professions in which uh, part of my job is acquiring, processing, analyzing large data sets. And a couple of the tools that I use, one is Microsoft Excel, but the other one is an application called Stata, which I'm pretty sure you're probably familiar with. And there are other tools like SAS, SPSS, and R and and whatnot. But my question is, a lot of these tools didn't exist back when you were first publishing your first price guides back in the late 70s and early 80s. Before a lot of these applications existed, even before a lot of modern computing existed. How exactly did you process a lot of that data to create your price guides? Okay. Uh, have never been asked that question before. Thank you, Chris. First of all, SPSS was available when I was in grad school, and that was in the 70s. SAS was emerging. SPS was in place. SAS came along. I did a lot of SAS programming in my doctoral work. Stata, no. And what was the other one? Not the other one. But it was mainly... Uh, that, yeah, that's, that's open and that's, source and... Yeah. And I programmed and did analysis in that. When you fast forward a little bit to the price guide stuff, the very first price guides were very survey driven, much less data, and they were more representative. They weren't card by card. So that when I got to the card by card analysis of the books and the magazines, there was already somewhat of a structure in place of what common cards and some of the very top cards. So there was an opportunity for more interpolation than extrapolation with dealing with some data points that were known. Maybe it's like filling in the mosaic. There's this painting and you have some fixed points in there and what you don't know can be reasonably filled in with the painting. Big data really came along in the digital revolution when we had a relationship with eBay and we could gather their data and clean it up. And that's the iteration after me. The first generation software was of my own and a few others uh, devising and it, it did not have the capability as much for big data. It was more expert-driven and uh, strategy-driven. Just the accumulation of data wasn't there. We had people, not at every show, but we had somebody on the West Coast, East Coast, in the Midwest, and reporting back to me, I was probably the goalie in terms of uh, finalizing some of the uh, price cuts because nobody could see it all. It wasn't all in one place. By the time we would have accumulated or done the data entry, we'd have missed the deadline. I'm not sure how to answer that other than those tools were known to me, used by me as appropriate, but not as much in the card thing. By the time the digital revolution and personal computer stuff was totally here with eBay back to the late 90s and the 2000s, we had a fresh software that was our own code that we wrote. So, okay. Thanks. My question, you have mentioned something about a potential crash or correction in the industry. And I'd rather hear it from you of what do you mean by that? And are there any scenarios that give you more heartburn than others in terms of the fact that we've had such a meteoric rise and how would that affect you? What is a crash scenario or a correction scenario that you think is realistic and that people could prepare for as an economist? I think there's a lot of parallels between the hobby as it is now and the hobby as it was maybe around 1990, 1991, you have a lot of people with a lot of money getting into the hobby that, let's be honest, really aren't interested in collecting the cards. We have a ton of stimulus into the economy right now. And a lot of that is fiscal stimulus. A lot of it's monetary stimulus. We have the Federal Reserve keeping interest rates near zero. So you have a lot of folks that are trying to look for something anything with a decent yield. And that's brought in a lot of money into the hobby over the last couple of years. There's a lot of product out there nowadays. And it's not just back then where it was just one flagship product, an update set, and maybe a premium set and a few oddball sets. You just take a look at at the kind of products that new products that have come out in the last couple of years. Do we really need Sapphire, Chrome, everything? Did we really need rip baseball. Yeah. So there's a lot of product out there. And, and even now, after the release of 2021 Series 1 tops, and the print runs of Series 1 this year have been calculated by some to be like 
75 to 90 percent more than last year's series one so we're starting to see tops and other companies crank up the presses like they did back then let me rephrase it because those are good points but my point to you that i'd like to get clarification from you is that i think the federal government has an interest in keeping inflation low in spite of all this stimulus and they're concerned about inflation and so as long as they keep interest rates low is there not going to be a, a continued interest in alternatives and, and tangibles so w- wouldn't that support that this run could go a little bit longer as long as they keep interest rates at close to zero i think this run will continue as until things start getting back to normal again. I think a lot of this current boom in the hobby is pandemic related. Okay. And I, and I think toward the end of this year and into 2022, as things start getting back to normal, I think we might see things starting to get back to normal in collecting again. Okay. So, so your turn yeah. for a question for me. It has to do with another question about the price guide. Why the decision to go to a two column format? a high-low quote column, because even today, I still run into dealers and collectors that really don't understand what those two columns mean. So some dealers will say the column on the left is for near mint and the column on the right is for mint, or they just totally ignore the left-hand column altogether and just go with the right-hand column. Why two columns? Why not just one column? Or why not like three columns, a low, high, and a median price. Okay. Thank you for your question. I have been asked that, but not in that way. We didn't go to it in one sense. It wasn't something we moved toward. It was there from the get-go in the magazine price guides. One of the reasons was to differentiate and distinguish from the annual price guides. The annual books that came out, obviously, once a year in each sport, back in those days, had three columns of prices by condition. Rather than having a magazine that was not going to be by condition, it needed to be more timely. So we decided rather than one price, which would be difficult to reflect the range of prices as we were going regionally across the country, we could see that there was a range of what you might see during a typical month. That's why it was done in two. So it was not based on condition. It's the same condition. But for most of those cards, you would hopefully not have to pay more than the high price. And you'd hopefully be able to buy it at the low price or if it was in quantity or or in certain parts of the country. So if a card was five bucks to 10 bucks, that meant we probably could find it somewhere for five and more easily find it for 10. But what happened, Chris, is no matter what we said, no matter how we editorialized, no matter how we answered readers, people were confused. They weren't confused operationally. They found workarounds or their own interpretations, but it didn't matter what I said or our team said. They just looked at it the way they looked at it. And like I said, I didn't criticize somebody if they just wanted to ignore the lower column. But I promise you there were dealers that used that lower column for buying. The unintended consequence of having two columns there allowed us to convey some additional information. Let's put it that way. And the way that information was misconstrued, that was common. And I don't even know that it was unfortunate because it was worth it to convey that additional information that cards don't have just one price and that that range could expand or contract based on the volatility or the variability of of the sale of the card. Okay, my turn. I think you like packs. And what's the ideal price and size of a pack in your mind? So not just for top cards for 50 cents. (laughs) I love it. But are there any parallels in there? Are there any inserts in there? Of course, you're not going to get much out of that. You're showing your age. I am showing my age. But, but uh, it's okay. But for going forward, what would what do you think the company should do? Is it a $5 price point? Is it 10 cards? Or what you know, does economics make sense? For a flagship product, like 10 to 12 cards for 250 that's a fair price nowadays. It's not priced out. For a more premium brand, maybe 10 cards for four or five bucks. Okay. And then maybe for a super premium brand, I don't know, like a finest or Bowman's best, maybe five or six cards for six or seven dollars. Okay. I think that's a fair price. Fair enough. Okay, your turn again. All right. You recently had Pete Williams as a podcast guest. And he wrote a book 25 years ago called Card Sharks. And I think reading this in Card Sharks was an anecdote about rookie cards. And For the longest time in the hobby, rookie cards really didn't carry much of a premium 
until sometime around the late 70s, when the hobby newsletters of the day postulated that because Topps gradually increased its production run, therefore a player's first card was worth more. So my, my question is, how did rookie cards become a thing in the hobby over the years? I was around, and uh, basically what I saw is I was in Texas in the early 70s, and I was in Ohio in the mid-late 70s. In the early 70s, it really wasn't a thing. But by 75, when I was up in Ohio and doing shows up there, it, as we moved from 75, 76, 77, each year got a little bit more. What happened was, and it was mainly coming out of New York, New Jersey, the you know the East Coast, there were people buying up the the first cards, the rookie cards, the early cards, but certainly the rookie cards. So when it became like an RC kind of thing, I'd have to do some research to figure that. But it, I think it just started with, like you said, there was a perception that the older the card, the, the lower the production was. So it not only would be a player's first card, his rookie card, but it'd be his, his least produced card. And but again, not a lot of emphasis on condition. The for Hank Aaron, he's got 54, 55, 56. When I started, those were all a buck or two. But then all of a sudden you'd find that people had a preference. <laughs> Somebody would say, hey, if they're all two bucks, I'll take those 54 errands. So you don't want the 55s. No, I'll take the 54s. But it, it started with with dealers that I remember, mainly on the East Coast, that were buying up the rookie cards. And, and that became so evident that people caught on. Hey, if it's a rookie card, it's going to go for more. And then now the elasticity has been just stretched way out of shape. So it's a real phenomenon. It's a, a primary motivator for value in the hobby. Hmm. Oh. Okay. If somebody gave you a card that was extremely valuable, that was not in your collecting wheelhouse, a different sport or a different era, what would you do with it? Would you display it? Would you sell it? Would you trade it? A very, an extremely valuable card. What would you do? Such as, I don't know. A Gretzky rookie because I don't collect hockey. Let's say Gretzky rookie then. Good example. Okay. You get a Gretzky rookie that some somebody in the neighborhood just says, Hey, I know you collect cards. I don't want anything. Let me just give you these old cards. And there's 10,000. Well, somebody cards just and gave cool. me a card like that. What would you do? First of all, I would tell them well, this card's pretty valuable. Maybe you shouldn't just give it to someone. But if you insist on giving it to me, I appreciate it. And I would probably keep it if it's one of those tentpole flagship cards that whether it's a Gretzky rookie or if somebody gives me a 52 tops, they're not. I would keep it. I wouldn't sell it. I wouldn't trade it. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd keep it. I'm not saying that's a trick question, but if it were to be a trick question, it's basically like when people do surveys, they can't ask the question, but your answer defines you as a collector and clearly not an investor can only see, not only a pure investor just sees the dollar signs and is figuring out when should I sell this asset? And a collector yeah. says, I'm going to cherish this collectible. If it's really valuable, you can't really put it on the mantle or on the counter because it's you've got to be a good steward. you got to protect yeah. it. The, the value because there is value there, but you're coming across, which is the reason we're, we can get along well is that we're collectors at heart. We love the cards. And so if you get a valuable card, it's still a card. If you had two of them, maybe you trade one or sell one. Most people don't have one, much less two Gretzky rookies or mantle, valuable mantle cards. Mantle. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for your thoughtful questions. And thanks for answering mine. Collectors can find you at Stale Gum or what, what other what other kind of ways? Uh, my social media is Stale Gum on Twitter and my websites are stalegum.com and baseballcardpedia.com. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Chris Harris. Thanks, listeners. We'll be back again tomorrow with another episode.